Hello there, welcome to the booth here at Grand Prix Oath of the Gatewatch. That's Randy Bueller. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, and we've got a stacked feature match area with a whole lot going on. We're going to send it down, and then we'll set the stage for you. Let's go down for round number 14 here from Atlanta. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Oath of the Gate. Watch I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Randy Bueller. We're all set here for round 14. Just a couple more, a few more rounds to go here in the tournament. But these are really important matches already at this stage. Um, let's take a look at our main match where we have Frank Lepore, who has put together one heck of a run oh, yeah. for his first Pro Tour. Frank is now sitting at 11 and 2, but he's got a tall order here. He's hitting across from. Yeah, that guy, Luis Scott Vargas, also at 11 and 2. Now, we'll, we're going to let the players get going here, but Randy, can you tell us what's going on in the feature match as a whole? Feature match, there are, oh my Whoa, goodness. Geez, hold on. There are two Eldrazi mimics in play on turn <laughs> one for Luis Scott Vargas, despite mulliganing to okay. six. Only three cards left in his hand, but who needs cards? Speaking of who needs cards, Lepore's on five here. Wow. And, yeah, this, yeah. and this is a win and in. The winner of this match should be able to get the draw to clinch up Sunday. You know, for all intents and purposes, we'll call this a win and in. There's actually five players on 11 and 2 coming into this round. All five are in the feature match area. You know what else all five are doing? All oh, this is a that. huge turn for Scott Vargas. He plays a Thought Knot Seer, which is going to pump up his other two Eldrazi Mimics to 4 4 strip. Jeez. Frank Lepore of any relevant spells and crunch in there for eight damage. Yeah, all five players on 11 and 2 have this core. They're all playing Eldrazi decks. And that is going to do it. Frank Lepore I don't says, think Frank hey, meant what he just said. He didn't game. sound very convincing. <laughs> No. Nor should he. Yeah, mold five and just get smashed. All right, so that's going to do it for game one here on round 14. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll set the stage for the other matches. Now for your Magic Collection with the newest Oath of the Gatewatch accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, play mats, and portfolios of your favorite Magic artwork at ultrapro.com. Standard is the name of the game at Oath of the Gatewatch Game Day. Join the action on February 13th and 14th at your local game store. Visit magic.wizards.com slash game day for more information. And welcome back to the feature match area here in Atlanta. We're going to head over to table C. That's uh, JC Tao versus Sam Pardee. They're both on Eldrazi. And Randy, I've been trying to let you set the stage for everybody <laughs> in the feature match, but things have been happening so quickly. So tell us what's happening as far as all the matches go. There are eight players in feature match area, okay. like normal. Mm -hmm. Seven of them are playing Eldrazi decks. <laughs> five, and five of them are in win and ins. All five of the 11 and twos, you know, th they're taking over the world. The thing is, though, it really is three distinct flavors of Eldrazi. I mean, here you see JC Tao. He's got the East West Bowl version of the deck, Eldrazi Sky Spawners. It's essentially the blue red version. I think the way to sort through all of these Eldrazi decks is there's a blue red version, which is the one you see here on the left of your screen. There's the mono black version, which is what Frank Lepore is playing. And then there's a truly colorless version. I don't know. Is it a devoid version? I guess. Sure. We'll have to figure out what we want to call the, uh, the CFB face to face version of the deck. And all three of of them are having success. Like, what is going to succeed at this Pro Tour? What's going to rise to the top of the Swiss? It's clearly the Eldrazi decks. And now it's just a question of, it's kind of, it's Eldrazi versus the world. So these teams actually broke it. Yes. Right. I mean, have you heard East, Be East West Bulls record with this uh, blue red version on day one? Yeah, 95% match win 19 percentage. 19 and one. Pretty insane. Um, in modern, which is generally thought of as the format, that you have to face so many different matchups, you've got to kind of take your hits when you get them and, and take your good matchups when you get them as well, and it's hard to dominate like yeah, this. Yeah, the, the and on the other side, channel, the Channel Fireball and face-to-face and -face -face games, obviously, they all team, they collaborated. Three of the five 11 and twos are from that team. <sighs> it's three of them, and then Frank Lepore and, and, and uh, one East-West Bowl player, Andrew Brown. Here we've got guys on three losses, so these guys are also both entirely live for top eight. Sam Pardee is from the face-to-face -face side of that. 
And the way the way I've heard the story, I mean, Sam was one of the guys who put the most work in on this. It was very much from the face-to-face -face game side of that collaboration that this deck came. Jacob Wilson had the initial build, and uh, Jacob is the guy they point to as sort of if there is one you know guy who had the most credit deserves the most credit for the design, it's Jacob. But Sam Pardee also clearly put a lot of the work in. All right. Well, you can see the board state here, and this looks pretty typical for what we see from JC's side. He's got. You know, two Eldrazi Sky Spawn, or three of them, excuse me, and all of their friends. All right. All right. So it looks like he's got, oh, here's a Ruination Guide, and he's just going to ship the team with yep. only one lowly blocker. This is uh, just a ton of damage. 15? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I nice Ruination Guide. <laughs> This deck's great. I, ha I haven't seen a ton of this deck specifically. Uh, on paper, it does look like it may actually have the advantage in these Eldrazi mirrors, and we may see a lot of Eldrazi mirrors down the stretch and tomorrow, so they're positioned quite well. Flyers seem good. Yeah, Ruination Guide on this board seems insane. Absurd. You look at the, the craziest part is look at the mana for <laughs> JC Tau. It's He's island, got three island. <laughs> He's got one Shivan Reef and two, two islands, and this is what he's done in modern. All right, so Sam Pardee is going to have to kind of suck it up here and dismember the Ruination Guide to save himself a lot of damage. He's also going to trade off his Mimic for one Scion here and still take a lot of damage falling to six, facing down lethal in the air. Crazy. Doesn't seem like Party really has a way to get out of this, right? The three flyers are going to be super tough for him. Yeah, I mean, his interaction with the opponent is Ratchet Bomb and Chalice of the Void. Uh, Spellskite interacts with some opponents, but not this one. He basically had to leave his mana untapped so that he can f power up a Nexus and block a Flyer. But even that, that even that's not enough, right? He's hoping JC won't attack with the Scion? It oh, yeah, yeah, he survives. Yeah. He can survive on one. Oh, oh well, my goodness. Well, how about an Obligator yep. to change the math here? And he's going to go ahead and sacrifice those two to steal it, and that's going to be lethal here. JC Tau takes game one from Sam Pardee. Now, you said this is a win and in, right, Randy? Uh, no, this is the one that's not. This is the one that's not. So these players these are guys both are 10 three. and 3. <laughs> right. Right. Now, we also have Shuhei Nakamura and Andrew Brown battling in our feature match area. They are on a win and in at 11 and 2. Yes, King And then we table. have kind of a half win and in right. on our back table with Yvonne Flock and Oliver Polak Rotman. Rotman's on 10 and 3, but Flock's on 11 and 2. And it sounds like we just heard an update. Yvonne Flock took the first game there. Uh, so score one for the, the CFB face-to-face -face Eldrazi. And Shuhei Nakamura is up a game in the uh, King of the Hill match against Andrew Brown. You know, it's going to be really interesting to watch how these Eldrazi decks evolve. I mean, look, clearly they're taking over the Pro Tour. Like, the story of this Pro Tour is going to be the dominance of this Eldrazi deck at this point. No. Songs will be sung about this deck. I, right. I, and, I know that. And there's very few moments in Magic. You know, you go years in between having, you know, people truly be able to break a format. But... Does that mean modern is broken? I, we, we can't know yet. Like, once these deck lists enough. get out, then can the world react? Now that you know what the target is that you have to beat, uh, yeah, jury's out. Look, deck looks great, and obviously the, the lands that create multiple mana have caused problems historically. But, yeah, for me, this is, you know, sit back and enjoy watching these guys sort of reap the benefits of putting in the work to break the format. And then we'll worry about modern once we get a couple Grand Prix in. Nice start here for Frank Lepore, by the way. He has an Eldrazi Mimic into a Matter Reshaper, into a Thought Knot Seer. Luis has a slower start this time with the Relic of Progenitus into a Spell Skite, and he is getting Thought Knotted here. Doesn't look like a lot to go with here either. Another Relic of Progenitus and a Simeon Spirit Guide. This draw has no Eldrazi for Luis. Not Weird. a one. A couple of Mutavaults. see what he took. He took the Spirit Guide. And he's going to go ahead and get in there for f for four damage.
It's interesting. Yeah, that Relic of Progenitus is not particularly exciting in this matchup. No. But it's better than Chalice of the Void. Sure. I don't, I don't know that Luis has a lot of good sideboard options for this matchup. I don't know if they expected that there would be this much Eldrazi that they'd have to slog their way through. And I mean, it wasn't that big a percentage of the field. It was like 7% of the day one field. Oh, there's another Thought Knots here for Lepore. Pretty brutal here yeah. from Scott Vargas' uh, standpoint, as now all of a sudden, 4, 8, 11 damage crunching into the red zone here. And uh, Luis is not going to be able to take much more of this. You know, game Feels. one went very quickly in Luis's direction, and this one doesn't seem to be going very well here for Feels like for we're Luis. going to game three. It does feel like it. Yeah, he found <laughs> another one to sort of chain them into each other. And there's a Blight Herder. That's a special one. Yeah, and that's yeah, gonna going to do it. Three. Frank Lepore evens things up in quick fashion. Both games going quite quickly there. And we're going to get a game three between these two. And remember, this is for top eight. And this is huge top eight for both of them, oh I have God. to say. You know, it's been a long time since Luis has been it back has in been. the top eight. And it means the world to him. And this is Frank's first Pro Tour. He's played for top eight against Luis Scott Vargas. Like, this is what you dream about as a Magic player. There's a reason it's the feature match yeah. and the lead. Huge match. Yeah, that game three just has such high stakes. All right, so let's take a look at our King of the Hill match, uh, which is Shuhei Nakamura versus Andrew Brown with Shuhei up a game. Remember, Shuhei tests with Team Channel Fireball, so he's going to be on the same deck that Luis is on. Or something similar, at yeah. least. And Andrew Brown's on the blue-red version t from Team e East West Bowl. And you were saying you think that the blue-red has the advantage in the matchup. I do. I think Eldrazi Obligator's ability to just steal the one giant Eldrazi and set up one huge attack is great. I also think Drowner of Hope is good in the matchup. And even uh, even the Sky Spawner as a, as a flyer can be good. All right, so that was a Thought Not Seer coming down in the early stages of the game here. It's like turn two, and it's going to take away an Eldrazi Obligator. I mean, there's one thing to say. I can say it's advantage. That, I don't think it's, you know, 70-30 advantaged. Mm -hmm. I think there's a deck edge, but skill still matters, draw still matters, and Shuhei's the one who's up a game here. Shuhei's up a game and just got not attacked at all that last turn, so things looking pretty decent for him. Man, Shuhei's... Stopped traveling to quite as many Grand Prix, but still just so good at the game. He's so good. Shuhei crushed the limited portion as well. All right, Matter Reshaper for him, and he's going to just trade off for an Obligator there with his uh, Mimic. Keeping an eye on table A in the upper right-hand side. Once they're ready to go, we can jump back and get the conclusion to see if this is going to be number six for Scott Vargas or number one for Frank Lepore. All right. Yeah, why don't we, why don't we jump back to that table? I, I don't want to miss a single turn of the action on uh, Frank Lepore versus Luis Scott Vargas. I know all of you at home want to see who wins that as well. We'll be keeping an eye on our side matches for you as well, bringing you any updates that are relevant. And we are off. This is a ghost quarter to kick things off for Scott Vargas. Not the most explosive start. Eldrazi Temple and a Mimic there for Frank Lepore. Both of these players have had excellent runs. 5-1 in limited for Scott Vargas, 6-0 for Frank. And they clearly have the uh, the right deck for the tournament here. Even though they have different flavors, they're both taking, if, taking advantage of the uh, Eye of Ugin Eldrazi Temple package. Frank trying to figure out how to play this from here. Goes Cavern for Wasteland Strangler without yeah, I got to say, Luis is going to be pretty relieved to see that. He's got a spell yeah. guide on board already. Yeah, none of Luis's lands tapped for two mana. 
One does now. Uh, until now, yeah. yes. That was a pretty good draw. So this is where you're supposed to play a Thought Not Seer if you're in Scott Vargas's Or seat. Reality Smasher. Simeon Spirit Guide into Reality Smasher okay. seems to be one of his options. Rarely a bad option. Or he can save the uh, Simeon Spirit Guide to try to get Oblivion Sower out on a future turn. That is one way that Luis can go over the top of what Frank's doing. Because generally speaking, Frank's build actually goes over the top of what Luis is doing, though not a lot. You know, but if, if Frank gets some Blight Herders going, mm -hmm. those are just, they match up well with Reality Smasher. You know, it leaves, it leaves Frank with some value behind. All right. Simeon Spirit Guide for Reality Smasher. That's the line for Luis. All right, Luis is not messing around here. He's going to ask for a double block, and he's going to get it. Sure. Even gets in for a couple of damage there, dropping Frank down to 18. Wow. Wow, big news from the King of the Hill match. Shuhei Nakamura finishes off Andrew Brown, and he's 12-2. and two. He should yeah, be in. he should be in. How many top eights is that for Shuhei? Is it like seven or so? Six? It's a bunch. Eldrazi Mimic is a follow-up play here for Scott Vargas. Not amazing. Well, it's it's not terrible given the Oblivion Sower he's holding to pump it up as soon as he gets one more mana. Awesome. Corrupted Crossroads for Frank. All right, this is number six for Shuhei. Six? Yeah. And Blight Herder. There are two cards in exile <sighs> wow. for Luis Scott Vargas. Look at that. Yeah, Frank's relics are a lot better than Luis's. Frank's relics are in there for value, and Luis's are a little more, you know, hose the graveyard deck style cards and can trip when you're desperate. I mean, one of them was a spirit guide. <laughs> well, that's true. Luis removed that one himself, <laughs> yeah, didn't he? Yeah, he did that work. All right, Funny. it looks like Luis has found... The land he needs? Yep. Yes, for the Oblivion Sower. And he's going to exile. Wow, four spells. He doesn't hit Swing any lands. And miss. Kind of. <laughs> he did get some nice stuff off the top of the library there. Sure. Don't know if he's going to be super sad about that. And this poor <laughs> Simeon Spirit Guide has just been tossed around between Graveyard and Exile. In the meantime, Mimic gets Five, to attack for eight. a ton. All right, so you heard Luis yeah. say it. On your upkeep, I'm going to ghost quarter your Eldrazi temple. That should just be a waste. In response, we'll tap. Sure. All right, in response, he's going to float a colorless, use it. Pop his relic. To pop a relic. Right, he's got to draw his card first there, though. And then, yeah, there are basic lands in these Eldrazi decks. Uh, Frank actually has basic swamp. Most of them have yes. basic wastes. That's right. That's the thing you can get from a ghost quarter or a path to exile. Same, same idea. But still, Luis downgraded his lands, right? Losing the Eldrazi Temple, downgrading it to a swamp is going to make it harder for Frank to deploy his hand. And his hand is starting to clog up with stuff. Yeah. Drowner well, of Hope, Thought Not Seer, Wasteland Strangler. Yeah, I think Frank wants to wait until the land's already out of his library to crack the relic there, right? Float, then get the land, then crack? Yeah, you know, small Probably stuff. mildly better. Op operational, but he does need some action here. It looks like he's got... A Drowner of Hope. Yeah, you can see his hand on the right-hand side of your screen there. Also a Thought Not Seer. So he's got action. Now, I do want to bring up w what happens to the loser of this match, whoever that may be. They play another win and in next round. Okay. So basically back-to-back -back win and ins for these two. Well, one of them. Right. They yeah, Frank, two, Frank they also... Shots had a win in last round. I mean, we're calling 12 wins good enough. If you're one of the first ones to get there, you can usually assume you'll be able to get the draw, intentional draw necessary to clinch. Okay. Frank's going to play a Thought Not Seer here. And the Thought Not Seer going to prompt gonna Luis yeah. to cast his dismember. Right, that takes down the Blight Herder. Oh, but 
there's the drowner of hope for Frank Lepore. Yeah, the eye of Ugin was insane for Frank here. Right, eye of Ugin has effectively made five mana uh, this turn. Absurd. And that wasn't there. Like, Luis used a ghost quarter yes. during Frank's upkeep. Right? To take, take out the On his upkeep, took out the only two mana land, and Frank, main phase, played what has amounted to a five mana land. Ah, sounds right. like JC. JC Tao got it done against Sam Pardee. Yep, he's 11 and 3 now. So the uh, colorless Eldrazi versus blue red Eldrazi split a pair of matches in the future match area so, around, this, so far this round. All right, he's going to ghost quarter the Eye of Ugin. Sure. Man, it got a lot of work done last turn. It though. did, yeah. Frank didn't even look. He, he knows that that was his only swamp. He's also got his only island in his hand, which is going to tell Var Scott Vargas something if he knows Go. anything about the list. I, I don't know that he does, though. I he I would be shocked if he knows the list well enough to deduce that. What he knows yeah. now is that future ghost quarters are just strip mines. Yep. He's got another one. To Luis. Endless oh, right. one. He finds an endless one, and it's big. I think it's a 7 7 here. That'll work. And he wants to go to attacks. Sure. Well, Drazi Mimic is also happy about that endless one. Though, Scion, of course, takes one for the team. Who's going to be the one to clinch their spot in the top eight? Yeah, what breaks this stalemate? I mean, Luis doesn't really have a I mean, breaker. Dr Drowner of Hope can do quite a bit for Frank here. He's got two Scions. If he can generate a bunch of other ones, he may be able to just one-shot Luis by tapping down his team and getting in for a ton of damage. A ratchet Bomb from Luis might clean that up a little bit, sure. potentially. It's possible. Also, Spellskite can just eat a lot of those taps, right? Yes. He just taps Spellskite a lot. That's true. Yeah, I'm thinking like Blight Herder. Make a big move. Both life totals relatively high here. During your upkeep, I'll use my own Ghost Quarter to take down your Eye of Ugin. Yeah, Eye of Ugin is a, a potential waste. breaker. Once you get enough mana to start activating the seven mana ability of Ugin, you just go get a never-ending string of Eldrazi from your deck. Any colorless creature. Yeah, those Ghost Quarters have done good work at preventing either player from getting to that. I think that Luis has a replacement eye in hand here. He's going to go to his attacks. Yeah, he wants to see if, he, if Frank is going to tap anything. Yeah. And uh, the 7-7 seven, seven Endless One is kind of big. Oblivion Sower is not exactly small. So Luis thinks, my creatures are just bigger than your creatures. I can attack. So he's going to send in the Oblivion Sower and the 7-7 seven, seven Endless One here. I feel like that spell Spellskite has just done a ton of good work making Drowner just not do what it's supposed to do. So Frank's considering his block still. He's up. Uh, let you know. I'll get back to you on this one.
Okay, he is going to double block here. Uh-oh, what does Luis have? Kind of pump fakes there, but does nothing. Lu Luis has a bluff. He just had a bluff. He okay. wants Frank to think about the fact that he's holding another. So he took out the Thought Knot Seer there. Yeah. Yeah, he wants to draw a card. And in fact, found a Thought Knot Seer of his own. So gets to deprive Frank of Wasteland Strangler. has been a really good game. We had two not so great games to start off with, let's be honest, but <laughs> these ones have been this one has been very good. Okay, Luis is going to attack with his 7-7 seven, seven endless one. Yeah, and drowner it's first. Be a double block here, and they're just sort of chewing through each other's resources. Well, here. Luis is doing that. Luis is the one who's decided, hey, let's chew through our resources. If you want a double block, great. I'm still going to have a thought not seer standing at the end of this, and an Eldrazi mimic, and you're down to a couple of scions. Frank is empty hand. No, not quite empty handed. He's got two lands in hand. He has an eye of Ugin, as well as Luis Scott Vargas, who also has an Eye of Ugin as his last card. There's also a Cavern of Souls in hand for Lepore. Simeon Spirit Guide off the top for Scott Vargas. So he went to Ghost Quarter of the Eye. Frank is going to respond to Ghost Quarter by activating it. Frank had actually been holding the Eye of Ugin in his hand until he had a turn where he wanted to spend seven mana that way. And what does he get here? A World Breaker or Can he even cast World Breaker? I, don't I guess know. if he sacks a Scion, he can. Maybe get just a, another uh, Drowner of Hope. This is game three, so he has ac access to sideboarded cards, too. We'll see what Frank comes up with. Yeah. I Ugin, as a, as a, he knew it was a one-shot activation, so this was the turn. Luis didn't hesitate to go quarter him. Luis is going to get a Scion off the board and a little more information before he lines up his attacks here. I love the way Luis, is, Luis has maneuvered this game. I mean, I don't know that Frank has done anything wrong, but I've been very impressed with the way Luis has sort of figured out how many creatures to attack with. Oh, kill your thought not seared so I can draw a card, and he's just... He's been pulling farther and farther ahead, and despite bang. the fact that it was Frank who had the Drowner. So it was a Blight Herder that Frank ended up searching up there. Sure. But remember, that was with Ghost Quarter ability on the stack, so Frank does not get a steady stream of cards from his Eye of Ugin here. Right, it was one shot. But there's plenty in the Exile Zone, so this Blight Herder is going to bring friends along. There it is. Get a little process going here and three friends. But look, Frank Lepore's life total down to three. Is this the time for Luis Scott Vargas to get back in the top eight? It's been a while for him. I know he's ready to be back. And he finds wow. a dismember here for the Blight Herder. Dismember to clear a blocker. Mutavault joins the attack. Send in the team. Are we going to see three chump blocks here? He goes down to one. Can Luis finish this off? Or can Frank Laporte top deck something amazing? Uh, we have to wait further. Relic of Progenitus to draw another card. What does he find? Another Blight Herder. That's a lot of cards to choose from. Has Frank just restabilized this board? It's not stable, right? He's acquired. I'm asking. <laughs> He's got a four, five, and three one ones now. Looks pretty stable. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And Luis passes a turn back. Wow. Frank is back in this game. That four, five blight herder is just the biggest creature around, isn't yep. it? Yep. Luis needs one more oh, creature, but there's a Thought Knot Seer, and it's going to take out a Simeon, Simeon Spirit, Spirit guide. guide. Not a big deal. 
But the 4-4 body is a big deal. Big deal. Frank is scrapping his way back in this, and Scott Vargas needs to find something to get back ahead. Jeez. Now, the good news for Luis is that it's going to be tough for Frank to start attacking anytime soon just because he's already at one life, so he just has so little to work with here. Right. So Luis probably will have time. And Frank, he just doesn't want to see Luis draw any more cards here. But he has to. Luis just draws his card and passes the turn back. What does Frank find off the top? He just had Blight Herder into Thought Not Seer. <laughs> Frank willing to attack. Frank is going to attack here. Wow. Luis is at 16. He can certainly take the hit. Yeah, he could. He's just going to chump, though, with the matter reshaper, and he's going to find a Thought Knot Seer with it. Scrabbling Claws. Scrabbling Claws, and immediately cashed in by Lepore, who's desperate for more action. He finds it, too, a matter reshaper. He knows he's going to get Thought Knot Seer next turn anyway. He just slams it on the table. And there it is. Sees that Frank's just holding an orb board. Just an orb board. <clears throat> How close is Luis to activating that Eye of Ugin on his side? It's got to be getting there. Yeah, close. Oh, dismember. He's going to dismember the Thought Knots here to draw a card right now. Indeed. I think he found a Reality Smasher here, Randy. He may just play the Urborg. He's already got one in play. He'll right. have to get rid of it, but just to play gain it as an a extra Lotus Petal. Yeah. Yeah, because now he can the cast Reality one. Smasher immediately. And pass the turn back. Wow, this game. These players are playing for top eight at the Pro Tour. <laughs> this would be Frank's first one in his first Pro Tour. What a way to start off. This would be Luis's sixth Pro Tour top eight if he were to make it. An oh, Eye of Ugin for Frank Lepore. Luis is out of close quarters now. Huge draw step there for Lepore. He's got enough mana to activate the eye as well. God, you can just feel the intensity down there. Look at Frank. Such pressure. Luis has been here before. Got Frank down to one, but Frank refuses to die, and he has fully stabilized this board. Now he needs to find a way to start cracking back and get Luis from 16 to zero if he's going to make it in. <laughs> Sacks a Scion so that he can leave Eldrazi Temple untapped. This way... He can play a Thought Knot here. He can play right a Thought Knot here, yeah. Tap for two, two mana discount from the uh, the Eye of Ugin. He goes for Blight Herder, so I guess he's gonna just sack a Scion for that, right? Yep, yeah, sack a Scion so they can get Blight Herder. Well, he'll get them back. Can he start attacking? Not really. Reality mm -hmm. Smasher holding down the fort quite nicely here for Scott Vargas. Yeah, the nice thing There's that... There's a waste. Yeah. Now can he activate his eye? It's six, right? It's seven to go. He's got it. Can tap that eye for black mana. Let's see. Does he need one more? I think he does. It's a tap ability on the eye, though. You can't it get is. black mana from the eye and then spend That's that right. black so mana on its activated one ability. Short. He needs one more mana to be able to start activating it. Now, Frank is already there. Which is a big deal. It's huge. It's just spells for days. Whoa. That is a big endless one, though. It is. It's a 10-10.
Yeah, Frank, by getting that Blight Carter, has really prevented Luis, Luis from getting wide. Like, the fact that Luis had Muta Vaults that he could attack with was potentially allowing him. And you saw he actually... Uh, he had them kind of set out. Yeah, yeah, he, he had a double block opportunity. He could have double blocked a... Uh, that earlier Thought Not Seer with Matter Reshaper and Muta Vault, but he didn't yep. want to lose the Muta Vault, both because it's a creature and also because he's really wanted to win this race to Ayavugan. I mean, Frank is clawing his way back in this game because he got to Ayavugan first. That's right. He's now activated it twice. I think he's got his own. Yeah, he went for Endless One this, this last time. Wait, what is that? It's a World Breaker. A World Breaker? Tries to aim it at Luis's land, and Luis says, no, you get Spellskite instead. At least I assume he aimed at a land. Yeah, I think he ended, aimed it at Eye of Lincoln. Yeah, that's certainly the most powerful permanent Luis has. Has to draw a land to get there, but if he does... Man, I don't know what happens to this game if Luis can get there. God, this has been such a good game. Both players playing excellently. Oh, he finds a ghost quarter here. Oh, Take wow. Take out the eye of Hoogan. And no more wastes for Luis to go get either. He finds an Oblivion Sower off the top, though. Oh, lands! Can he hit an eye? Can he hit his opponent's eye? No, he can just go get him out of the exile oh, zone. Oh, my God. They've all been exiled They're in the with exile Relic. zone. He gets what all just of those. happened, Marshall? <laughs> That Oblivion was huge. Sower to get all those lands out of exile. This is absurd. Can can Luis now turn the corner with the Eye of Ugin plan with all these extra lands? There's an eye. <laughs> he says you can keep that one. <laughs> I only need one Urborg here. Right. <laughs> and that's a ghost quarter as well. Wow. Sure. Ghost quarter for Frank's eye. Exactly. And there it goes. Ayavugan <laughs> gone. That Oblivion Sower was huge. Uh, it's certainly the best Oblivion Sower I've ever seen. Ever seen. Not close. Eldrazi Temple for Frank Lepore. Jeez. But now Luis is the one with the Eye of Ugin ready to start charging up his hand. Gut Is shot for the win! Gut shot off the top for gut Luis. Gut shot for the win! Oh my he god. Drew gut shot to put him in the top. <laughs> oh eight. my god. Luis Scott Vargas draws gut shot and he's in to the top eight. Unbelievable. Look at that smile. Huge smile from Luis Scott Vargas. Awesome job. And for Frank Lepore fans, he gets another shot at it. That was not the end of the road for Frank. Nope, he's still playing for it next round. He's still playing for it next round. But Luis gut wins shot. the match with gut shot off the top of the deck. Unbelievable. Let's jump back to our other table here. Oliver Pollock rotman versus Yvonne Flock. As we come into the match here, they're tied at one game apiece, and we're starting off game three. That was insane. I guess you put it in your deck to kill, to kill the Mimic, right? Yeah. Seems solid. I get a feeling Luis is going to put that card in a lot of decks for a lot of years to come <laughs> to relive that moment and play many of them against Paul Chion. <laughs> right, we're going to get trolled by that gut shot moment for years, and it's going to be awesome. Wow. What that an was insane. incredible game. Really well played by both players. Agreed. And now we're going to jump in here on Oliver Pollock Rotman. All right, let's switch gears. Infect versus an Eldrazi deck that's basically the same one that Luis is playing, right? This is Yvonne Flock, who had kind of migrated over to the face-to-face uh, -face team. Is that right, Randy? Yes, yes. Yeah, he's uh, he's face-to-face. -face. <coughs> so this is the same Eldrazi deck you just saw Luis win with. Different matchup, though. Oliver Pollock Rotman, the one non-Eldrazi deck that managed to sneak into this feature match area this round. He's on Infect. That is definitely a deck that has had good uh, good results this weekend. Not quite as good as the Eldrazi deck, but it's kind of the next best rate. Blight 
United agent for Oliver Pollock Rotman. Yeah, huge game three here. Uh, Oliver Pollock Rotman needs to win to stay in contention. Ivan Flock was the fifth guy on 11 and 2, so he got paired down. It's actually kind of remarkable that the uh, CFB face to face alliance didn't have a mirror match. They were three of the five players on 11 and 2, but none of them got paired against each other. Fortuitous pairings for that. That is good. And both, both Luis and Shuhei won. Right? Yeah, Luis and Shuhei. Six top eights apiece if they get the ID they need to make this top eight. Maybe with each other? They, I mean, if Flock loses, then yes, they'll be paired against each other. They're the t only two players on X2. That's a nice handshake. Yeah. Teammates, good friends, six top eights each. Fellow Hall of Famers, Hall yeah. Of Famers. Six apiece. That's a 12 top eight handshake. Hey, you want to go get a sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> the best tasting sandwich in the history of <laughs> Magic the Gathering, for sure. So Ivan Flox picked up just a single poison counter so far. Rotman's down to 11 life here. And you can see that spell skite for Ivan Flock. It just wreaks havoc with this infect deck. deciding how to approach this next turn. He's just going to attack for the one again. God, how much work has Spellskite done in this list? No kidding. Card is insane in this matchup. Spellskite has been great. The Infect deck has to bring in Artifact Destruction just for it. Yeah, I mean, some of the main deck Spellskite hate, right? You see Twisted Images Twisted floating image. around the list. Mm -hmm. I know the Pantheon list has main deck Twisted yeah, Image. It's because it's such a big problem for them. Right, but then they have to find their Twisted Image, right? You just buy a couple turns. The Eldrazi deck doesn't need to buy many turns. No, it yeah. applies massive pressure. And anybody who's seen the Infect deck knows that it does not play defense well. Yeah, it's it's a little bit faster as a Goldfish deck, yep. but you know, throw a little bit of disruption in there, and sometimes that can just uh, mess them up. Yeah, and Yvonne knows, okay, I don't have this game won. I want to end it in as few draw steps for Oliver Pollock Rotman as I can. And you can see that's exactly what Yvonne's doing here, attacking with basically everything that he possibly can on the battlefield. The Glistener Elf is going to chump block here, but even that, he's taking eight damage down to four. Yeah, Flock is trying to set up to go next time. Five. Okay, this is probably 12. Sorry, yes, then four. 17, then five to 12. Okay, now four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, big draw step. It was land. Which isn't always bad sometimes. It's just the delve card, the delve that you need for become a man. Yeah, right? one more fetch land. Yeah, we saw that with Andrew Cunio. Yeah, before. he was a fetch land away from, from winning this matchup. Last round of the future match area. Well, like Rotman's hand is all giant growths. Might of Old Crosa, Vines of Vastwood, Vines of Vastwood, and now that Misty Rainforest. That is not going to get it done versus an opposing spell skite. Oliver's from Austria. Let's see, he's got his shirt on for the team. All right, so he's going to go with Vines of Vastwood on the spell skite here, Randy. Oh, okay. So he's saying that the spell skite, what is, what is the exact template? It gains hexproof? Is that how Vines of Vastwood works these days? Yeah. Right. Can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control, which means that if this resolves, Yvonne will not be allowed to redirect any future giant growths onto the spell skite. That's right. I may have misspoken. I forgot about this interaction. So you can't redirect a spell skite. Spell skite is not a legal target for Vines of the Vastwood, which means... No, it still works. All right, well, that looks like that's it. Ivan Flock has won his match. Does that put him into the top eight? There, there are three players now 
on X and 2. So that was Oliver Pollock Rockman trying to trick Yvonne Flock and only tricking me? That's what just happened? Apparently. Yeah, yeah, okay. It was very convincing. It, 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 I bought it. Yeah. It's like, oh, is this, does this work? Wait a minute. No, no, it doesn't work. Yvonne Flock is the winner. Yvonne Flock will be at X and 2 going into this last round. So <laughs> we go into this last round. There are three players who are one intentional draw away. They're all teammates. <laughs> They're all playing the same deck. Yvonne Flock, Shuhei Nakamura, Luis Scott Vargas. Stop me if you've heard of these guys before. Three of the Pro Tour's true stars. Unbelievable. And we certainly know the story of this Pro Tour, right? It's just this Eldrazi deck is just absurd and crushing. So we're so two of them are going to get paired up. Yep. Sandwich time. Handshake. What about for the other one? How does that normally plan out? So that's going to be an X2. Will they also be paired up against an X2? They will be paired against an X3 who will not be a, in a position to draw. Okay. So it's like if you win, now you're the one seed. If you lose, you still hope to get the draw in the last round. Okay. Now, the way the standings play out, it looks like we're going to see you know one or two 12 and fours. It's kind of what we normally see at the Pro Tour. Okay. Looking at the standings now, it looks like we're in that range again. So okay. even the guy who gets paired down, Still, you know, 98% going to get right. in. Well, I know that Rich Hagen's at the news desk, and he is going to have all the updates and all the action as we wind down the Swiss portion of the tournament. Let's send it to him. It's true, Marshall. Uh, and thanks to Marshall and Randy for bringing us one of the great games of Magic. That third game between Frank Lepore and LSV is one for the ages. But mark it now. So much to learn, so much to see. Just outstanding Magic. Good luck to Frank Lepore as we head down the stretch. Congratulations to Louis Scott Vargas. He's right on the verge, still needs a handshake. 36 points isn't enough right now, but Shuhei Nakamura, 36, Louis Scott Vargas, 36, even Flock, 36, overwhelmingly likely to somehow, somewhere in the next two hours, shake hands and be in. Down on the floor is our Brian David Marshall. So why don't we find out what's going on in what is a pulsating round 14. BDM, what you got? All right, all right, Rich. I just watched Patrick Dickman win his match against Gregor's Koloski. And uh, there's not that much else going on in the feature match area. I just did, saw Kentaro Yamamoto just defeated Mike Sigris. There was a through the breach, and Emrakul was sent through it. It destroyed all the permanents on Mike Sigris' side of the table. He stayed alive for a couple turns, but it wasn't enough. And then I see a couple matches here. Nathan Holliday's playing Paul Rietzel. Here I see Lucas Blohan playing Paulo Vitor Damodorosa. It looks like it looks like that might be a result. Do we know who won here? Do you know who won here? PV just won his match. And let me see if I can get an update here from Paul. Who won over here? Paul, Paul just defeated Nathan Holiday, and that really is that really is all the results from this top table area. I had some, and that's about all we have here from the floor at Pro Tour Oath of the Gate Watch. All right, thanks very much to Brian David Marshall. Now, there are a couple of really interesting ones he gave us there happening right on the floor as it happened. Paolo Vida Dama de Rosa, by beating Lucas Blahon, is still technically alive on 30 points. He's up to 30, a Lucas Blahon on 27 is gone. Let me tell you about all the people who are gone because all the 27 pointers were against each other. So the people I'm reading out to you now cannot make the top eight. Dan Lanthier at nine wins. Daniel Grafensteiner, Michael Majors, Jeremy Dazani, the Pro Tour champion. Uh, Andrew Cuneo is done. Yuki Ichikawa, Martin Muller, he's now had his fifth loss formally eliminated. Matej Zatelkai is gone. Greg Papura of the United States is gone. Another Austrian, Emmanuel Gershenson, his fifth loss out. Sam Farmeratnam of Canada, gone. And Tonino De Rosa, Shoti Yasuoka. Martin Clement of Scotland, great run by him, but at nine and five, he cannot now win the Pro Tour. Uh, Lucas Blahon, 27. Great stuff right there. Um, and then Jelga Vigesma, he is still alive on 30 points. Now the 33s, they are absolutely in the mix. They're going to play each other. We have one pair of 36s, which could be any two out of Shuhei Nakamura, Luis Scott Vargas, and even Flock, all teammates, all on the same deck. That's ridiculous, by the way. They are there. Why don't we talk to one of the players who is at 12 and 2 right now, fan favorite, Brian David Marshall with Luis Scott Vargas. Thanks, Rich. Luis, that was <laughs> one of the great matches we've seen at the Pro Tour in a long time. 
What was going through your head as that game went back and forth down the stretch? I could not believe I was going to lose that game. So for him to get back into it, because I got I had a great opening draw, you know, like I, I and I was really pressuring him. He was at one life with no creatures in play, no cards in his hand, and I had three creatures in play. And he drew relic, cycled the relic, removed cards from my graveyard, played Blight Herder to get tokens. But I knew I had four good Ink Moth, ne Blink Moth Nexus, and uh, three Gut Shot in my deck. So, and he was a one. So I figured like, there's no way that I'm gonna lose if it goes long, especially since I can draw other things. But then like, he, we both just kept playing insane things. He played an Ayabugan, I played an Ayabugan. He activated his, I killed his. He got World Breaker, I spell skited it. Finally, I peeled Oblivion Sword, which was also awesome because he had it relic 20 times. <laughs> so I put like eight lands into play, half of which were legendary. But when I drew the gut shot, I think I was gonna win anyway because I think I was gonna be able to start Ayabuganing and he didn't have an Ayabugan. So we're both saying go and I'm drawing an Eldrazi every turn. But yeah, that was an absurd game. My my uh, excitement level was just through the roof. And uh, how many gut shots do you think will be put in front of you <laughs> at events uh, over the next year for your signature? Uh, I think I've given Gutshot a good name. <laughs> I don't know how many. <laughs> All right. So, Luis Scott Vargas, uh, you know, we're sad that perhaps you won't be in the booth this Sunday. No, it's not a luck. I've been congratulated before when I've been, uh, for making top eight and not made top eight. So, uh, I've got to go try to draw my round here. All right. We're wishing you luck on the handshake from Luis Scott Vargas. This is Brian David Marshall here on the floor.